Bismillah wa salatu wa salam First of all, it's a pleasure being with all of you. And uh, uh, I think like today we are trying to uh, touch upon a, a bit of an unusual topic for uh, a mass convention. But uh, all credit goes to the organizers because uh, we, we had this idea about having this session uh, very late. But mashallah, they were uh, very responsive and uh, I really applaud their uh, uh, enthusiasm about the topic. So today we are talking about the strategic importance of entrepreneurship in general to Muslims in America. And to start, uh, we wanted to think about how to make this session as practical as possible. So when we thought about it, Basil and myself, we thought about two levels. The level at the macro scale, which is for us as Muslims here in America, why entrepreneurship is so important. And then at the micro scale, if I'm to really embark onto an entrepreneurial journey, what is it that I need and uh, what kind of uh, measures I need to follow in order for me to maximize my chances of success? So to start, what is entrepreneurship? What is it that we are talking about? So as defined by the Library of Economics and Liberty, entrepreneurship is a process of discovering new ways of combining resources. When the market value generated by this new combination of resources is greater than the market value, these resources can generate elsewhere, individually, or in some other combination, the entrepreneur makes a profit. In Wikipedia, if you Google entrepreneurship, you will find that entrepreneurship is the process of designing, launching, and running a new business, which is often initially a small business. In simple terms, entrepreneurship is the art of making value out of nothing. That is what we are talking about. And obviously, if you think about entrepreneurship in general, I guess like many of you did whether read or uh, listen or watch to videos about the topic. But I just wanted to have a, uh, a bit of a feel of the audience. So how many of you did at least like once watch anything about entrepreneurship? Can I have a show of hands? Okay, that's very pleasant. How many of you are either thinking about entrepreneurship at whichever scale or are already in the path of having a business, whether like full time or on the side? Show of hand. That's amazing. So to start, we don't we are not here talking about entrepreneurship in general. We are talking about entrepreneurship for us as Muslims in America. And I will start to cover three dimensions and the first one is why entrepreneurship is strategic for us as Muslim Americans in general. And the other one is why entrepreneurship is strategic for us as Muslims, let alone being Americans. And third, and last but not least, at least in my part of the session, which is what characteristics should I have as a Muslim entrepreneur to be successful? So what would make me successful, particularly as a Muslim entrepreneur? To start about, the first one, which is, why is it so strategic for us as Muslims to think about entrepreneurship seriously? First and foremost, Muslims, Muslim Americans, first and foremost, let's talk about the big picture, which is, what is it that we are trying to achieve as Muslim Americans here in this country? We want to make a difference. So for the past 30 to 50 years or so, we've been building ourselves internally. We've been building our communities building the infrastructure for these communities. And mashallah, we have a very solid infrastructure right now. I think like if we are talking and you will see all of the speakers touching upon this from various angles, which is what is it that we are trying to achieve in the upcoming 30 to 50 years is to make a difference in the lives of every single American out there. And that's not so hard or like that's not kind of like wishful thinking. That needs to be our strategic goal. And if we are trying to make a difference in this country, we need to dig deep into the elements that did help in developing this country the way that it is right now. And if you are to focus more on how this, this country did get developed, you will find that entrepreneurship has been an intrinsic catalyst behind developing America as we see it. So all of us, for example, uh, like when like Americans are being raised, they do celebrate and do get to know about inventors such as Thomas Edison and Benjamin Franklin. But also, they always recognize the value that the likes of Henry Ford or Andrew Carnegie 
did present to this country. And lately, none of us doesn't know the effect that a Steve Jobs, for example, or a uh, Bill Gates did provide not only to this country, but in general to the world. But we are here talking about entrepreneurship at different levels. So literally the small business owner or like the independent grocer uh, in your vicinity is also an entrepreneur. And he is trying to make a difference just at a different level. So we are here talking about whether like at a big scale or a small scale, what type of a value we can make through entrepreneurship. And if you dig deep to see what effect entrepreneurship can have for us as Muslim Americans, we will see a tangible effect on three fronts. One of them is the economic front, the other one, which is a social front, and obviously the third one, which was the da'wah front. To start on the economic front, no community, if we are talking about evol like evolving this community to become a solid Muslim minority, no community would be able to sustain and make a difference on the ground without being financially self-sufficient. But more importantly, financially viable and profitable and more importantly, strong from a financial standpoint. So if we look at the time of the Prophet Aisha, there is no way that you could imagine the evolution of the da'wah of the Prophet Aisha without, without a, uh, Uthman ibn Affan, for example who was able to uh, fund the preparation of one third of an army in Jaisul al-Usra by himself. The role that Abu Bakr, for example, did have when it comes to freeing slaves out of his own money is, is kind of like undebatable. So when it comes to financial strength from a community standpoint and looking at our situation here, you would immediately realize that this country and the way that it's being set up, like being having like cities and then like counties and then states and so on, definitely the whole system like really appreciates and listens to businesses. So if you are in a city, the city council would definitely listen to the businesses who are in this city and would definitely take their opinions into account. And like you grow from a scale standpoint and that effect grows as well, but also, it's not just about being effective and making a difference on the ground, like through being financially viable, but more importantly, on the social level. And you will find that if we are here talking about business owners, businesses in general right now are all like all moving towards having a corporate responsibility, speaking at like spending in a way that is responsible caring about like the actual well-being of their local communities. And that's obvious. And like in general, when we talk about how Muslim owned businesses can make a difference in their local communities at different scales, whenever they are really driven by a vision that would be driven by Muslim owners, that could be huge. And corporate social responsibility could have, and like if you look at like at our uh, Silicon Valley, for example, you would look at a Google.org, for example, and the amount of a value that a Google.org, which I happened to be at Google at some point, and I used to see the, the founders of Google, which are just two college dropouts, PhD students, but again, like they never believed that they could reach to that scale, but now that they are at this scale, look at the positive value that they are making on the ground. Finally, from a da'wah standpoint, from like making a difference in the lives of people at large, if you are running your own business at whichever scale, you do have the luxury of a making a direct that like a direct uh, difference in the lives of people who are working for you, and like you can not neglect how this could be really, really of potential value. So we as Muslims in general, we are supposed to be messengers of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this country. If you are running your own business and people do work for you, whether like this business is restaurant or outlet or whichever small business or like it's a medium to large business, you have people that their provision is dependent on you. Allah made you responsible for it. You have people that if you are being nice to them, this will make a difference in their lives. 
You have people that maybe, for example, from a visa standpoint, and they are like workers that do depend on you. And just showing kindness at this type of a capacity is going to be huge. But also, all of us, especially the ones who have been exposed to corporate America, we understand how important the corporate culture is. And we understand that in many cases, we as Muslims, we may or may not be comfortable with many things that do happen. Like, for example, if you are into sales, you happen to be in meetings where like, there is drinking all over the place, right? So imagine that you are at the position where you are to set this corporate uh, culture. And imagine the power that you have in your hands to be like generously treating your employees and giving them as many perks as possible, but at the same time being cautious of the things that you as Muslim, you want to avoid and maybe be able to uh, implement and I would say like in, in some way dictate that to the corporate uh, culture. So if we are like summarizing the financial or the social or even the da'wah level, it's huge for us as Muslims and Muslim Americans to think about entrepreneurship in general. However, just forget about Americans for a second. And I would move on to the second dimension, which is why is it for us as Muslims at a high level? So if we are talking about entrepreneurship as making a positive change in the lives of people through any type of a business and like that business would try to address a need of people in a small location or like a huge need. So for example, think about our lives before Uber and after Uber. Think about our lives before Microsoft Word and after Microsoft Word. But also think about like that independent grocer that did open in a far neighborhood and like did address an immediate need for people living over there. So when you look at that and when you look at the core value of Islam and looking at how the Prophet ﷺ says, أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ the most beloved people to Allah, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say Muslims. The most beloved people to Allah are the ones who are the most beneficial to people, to humanity at large. So if we are looking at entrepreneurship as a means for you to address needs for people at whichever capacity and whichever scale, this is highly correlated to the core of the value of Islam. But also, Looking at uh, equity investment and looking at the financial uh, sector for a second, right? And looking how the financial sector as of today is driven by banking and interest. And I think like there was a very nice session yesterday about uh, investment in general. But if you look particularly about the Silicon Valley and how big companies such as Intel and Google and, micro and, and Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, all of these companies were developed, they were actually developed through what we call equity investment. And equity investment means like you value a company and then um, you as an entrepreneur, even if you do have an idea, even if it's not bringing money, you do value it and people do put this money based on this valuation and it's agreed upon. And actually the whole point here is that you have a pie and you try to grow that pie. So. If you look at this model of equity investment, and obviously this is just like a quick glance over the model, this model is very related to the Islamic financing models that are like Mudaraba, for example, and Musharaka particularly. The whole point of Islamic financing is that um, you are trying to use money to create value in the society. And using that money needs to be in a way that is a win-win so that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a person that's leveraging from the money and selling money as a product in itself. So if you look at Mudaraba, for example, and Mudaraba has been one of the basic tools for building uh, uh, the, financial, the, the in financial industry for Muslims in general, which is if I do have some sort of a money and I, there is another person who do have a skill set and let's say that person comes to me and tells me, hey, I would like to buy this lot and then sell it. And I do have $100, so he engages with me in such a limited transaction. 
he does the effort and then at the end, maybe we split the revenue. Let's say like it's been sold at $300. So we split that revenue, 150 and 150. In simple terms, this is mudaraba. And mudaraba, if you think about it, it's so unique because it allows a person who had a skill set or in other terms, an entrepreneur to actually develop wealth out of like out of the blue from scratch. And believe it or no, the whole financial industry, when it comes to how the like the financial industry did interact with the Silicon Valley, the whole financial industry did give up on the interest based models and adopted that equity investment, which is very similar to Mudarabah, just because the potential return that the investor could make is huge. So if you think about this model that non-Muslims did enrich and did work on improving, how about our case as Muslims that we are trying to provide values and, and answers for the societal problems? Shouldn't we be the first ones who are actually trying to push for this model and trying to like grow this model? That is on the financial side, why we as Muslims, we need to really worry about or entrepreneurship and about the whole idea of equity investment as a way to grow businesses. So now that we covered why as Muslim Americans and why we as Muslims, I would just like move on to talk about you as an entrepreneur. Let's kind of like switch gears. I hope that like by now we understand why is it significant for us as Muslims and Muslim Americans to focus on entrepreneurship? So now, you want to embark on an entrepreneurial journey. I will start to talk about top-level characteristics that you need to enrich and grow in your own self. So, first and foremost, you need to have mental toughness. And when I say mental toughness, I mean the ability of positively using setbacks and building on top of them rather than being broken easily. And subhanAllah, if you look from, a, from an Islamic standpoint, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ بْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٍ لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْا عَلَى مَا فَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا أَتَكُمْ There is no calamity that could attack you except when it's written in a book before Allah creates the heavens and the earth. In order for you to be not feeling so sad whenever you miss any, on anything or you feel so happy whenever you achieve anything, let's look at entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is all about dealing with setbacks. So it's like if you are an entrepreneur, don't think that it's going to be rosy and don't think that because you are a believer, it's going to be so easy. It's not. It's not going to be. So, but the thing here is that mental toughness and actually that's what distinguish any like successful entrepreneur, regardless of whether they are Muslims or no. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about us as Muslims, إِن تَكُونُوا تَأْلَمُونَ فَإِنَّهُمْ يَأْلَمُونَ كَمَا تَأْلَمُونَ وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ If you are feeling any hard, hard, like, like hardness or calamity, or like you are uh, struggling, they do struggle as well. However, what differentiates you from them is that you seek the hereafter, they seek this life. So, as an entrepreneur, if you set your intention right that you are doing this for the sake of Allah, in every single calamity, Allah can find a way for you. So, mental toughness. The second one is being able to develop that art of making calculated risks. The art of calculated risks is huge for entrepreneurs. So, in general, if you are an entrepreneur, you will have always many options to choose from. You will always have many paths and you need to follow one of them. And there is no kind of like by the book answer. You would need to be able to assess the risk and the reward. And this is something, again, Muslims and non-Muslims do face. However, you as a Muslim, you need to be always dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not to say that this will make everything rosy. Again, it wouldn't. But the thing here is being able to... Um, develop that skill set of making risks or like taking risks in general and being able to be ready to, uh, as, uh, to accept the fact that you may face failures. And that's very normal throughout your entrepreneurial journey. The third one is 
to aim high. To aim high is crucial for you as an entrepreneur. You know Mark Cuban? Mark Cuban had a video, and I, I was watching a video about him, the well-known billionaire. And he was thinking that, he was saying that people were telling me that I couldn't sell the company except for 100 million. But I was telling them I'm joining the Billionaires Boys Club. And literally, he sold the company for $5.6 billion. And he did believe he was aiming high. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ says for aiming high in general, right? If you are to seek, seek the best. And if you are doing, if you are asking Allah for paradise, don't just like be satisfied with getting by. Ask Allah for the best, which is Jannatul Firdaus. That's a hadith. Do map this onto whatever you are shooting for as an entrepreneur. Like you need to be persistent. You need to be able to take risks. However, you need to always shoot for the best and like try. And whenever you are to fail, you try again. However, like you need to think big. And actually, this is something that uh, many of us do lack. Many of us think that being humble is like being satisfied with what is okay. That's not, that's not the case. Like you need to be always aiming high. And aiming high will get me to the next characteristic, which is the ability to sell. The entrepreneur is selling all day long. The entrepreneur is selling a vision. You need to be able to sell a vision to the people who do work for you. You need to be able to sell a vision to your investors. And more importantly, you need to be able to sell that vision to your own family that will be able to support you, to your friends, right? You know, friends and family usually are the first source of funding for an entrepreneur. So the thing here is the ability of selling depends on your ability to articulate any value proposition in no time. And that's actually an art, but it's not that you are born like that, right? And like some people are, have that um, ability to sell better than others. But the thing here, the Prophet ﷺ says, You need to be able to uh, pitch people, right? You know this elevator pitch, they always say it through, uh, throughout entrepreneurship. You need to be able to pitch people your idea in a very clear way. And like if you go and, for example, watch a shark tank, you see how people get grilled whenever they are unable to articulate their ideas. You need to be, as an entrepreneur, able to articulate your ideas. And more importantly, you need to have a vision. And the good news here is that when you do have a vision, what differentiates you as a Muslim is that you have the ability of picking such a mission and vision that goes along your big picture, which is, I am a Muslim. I would like to make a difference, a positive change in the society, in the world. And I do whatever I can. Where, like, whether like Allah will help me or no, whether Allah will allow me to reach the best or Allah will allow me to reach half of what I am seeking for or Allah will make me fail. That's not the point. The point here is to be able to shoot for the best. Finally, you need to be able to cultivate and leverage a network. And this is where the importance of the surrounding network for you is huge. And let's face it. We have real trouble whenever we are to know the qualities or the skill sets of the person praying right next to us in the masjid. Like, we just tend to think of, hey, like, this is my brother, I'm dealing with them uh, throughout, like, the quote-unquote Muslim context. But we don't tend to know what are the skill sets of your own brother, of the people who are surrounding you, because guess what? When you are an entrepreneur, you may need such an intro. You may need early investment. You may need to have like business with some other folks. And people who are close to you are like of huge importance. That's why any entrepreneur would need to have such a network. So whether like it's mental toughness or the art of calculated risks or aiming high or selling, 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 selling all the time, selling to everyone and being able to sell a vision. And finally, leveraging the network. And subhanAllah, today um, we will have this other discussion about the importance of the professional network in general. Um, so hopefully we will have a better chance to uh, have uh, that discussion around how do we cultivate and leverage our professional network. I guess like talking about um, the strategic and like the big picture uh, was my part. I hope that I was able to do it in a nice way. I think like right now, if I'm 
to assume that you guys are sold on the importance on embarking on through an entrepreneurial journey. Maybe like I would pass the floor to uh, Brother Basil to talk about what the do's and don'ts. What do you do in order for you to actually maximize your successes, your, your chances for success as an entrepreneur? Thank you very much.